Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Everybody E-Rate. My name is Lauren Abner, and I'm the technology consultant for the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives. One of my primary responsibilities is to act as the state E-Rate coordinator for Kentucky Public Libraries. So if you have E-Rate questions, want to set up a meeting to just chat about possibilities or with like form filing assistance, and I, I just love taking those questions. So throughout the presentation, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. We've got a lot on our plate this morning. If you've done E-Rate in the past, you know that I tend to overstuff my presentation, so I may end up skipping certain sections. When you look at the full page slides, the presentation uh, contents has links to jump to different sections. I do want to point out um, that for folks who are a little more experienced with E-Rate, I have added a couple slides on special topics that you may want to look for. Uh, so that would be special topic kiosks and special topic unique entity identifier. They are highlighted on the, uh, on the contents. One moment. Okay. Before I get into the bulk of the presentation, I do like to point out that while I do my very best to provide the most up-to-date and accurate information, um, I am not the funding authority for this program, the governance. Uh, I'm not the FCC. I'm not the daily administrator for this program. So ultimately, if the Federal Communications Commission or USAC says something different, um, they definitely overrule me. And also, what I show today may be accurate, but things may change, especially the appearance of the portal we use for E-rates and some of that navigation. It's constantly shifting. All right, so first up, what is the E-rate? Uh, for those of you who may be uh, new to filing for your library. So I've already mentioned these two agencies, but to reemphasize, uh, the rulemakers, the governance for the E-rate program uh, comes from the Federal Communications Commission. I'll just refer to the FCC from here on out. Um, the daily administration of the program is handled by a nonprofit called the Universal Service Administrative Company. I'll just refer to them as USAC, USAC, from here on out. So E-Rate is short for a nickname of the program, which is Education Rate. The full title of this program is something like the Universal uh, service program for schools and libraries, but we just all call it E-Rates. This program has been around since 1998. And E-Rate is just one of four universal service programs uh, designed to make connectivity more equitable um, around the country, regardless of your circumstances. So schools and libraries participating in this program get discounts on internet access, internal networking equipment, um, and the discounts depend on the level of poverty in the area. So, for example, um, you know, a lot of Kentucky libraries are near the top of the bracket, but the discounts range uh, from 20% to 90%. Two of the core principles of the E-rate program are competitive bidding and cost effectiveness. Competitive bidding is meant to drive down the costs of E-rate eligible services. And when schools and libraries are evaluating the bids they receive, they have to choose the most cost-effective solution, meaning that the E-rate eligible cost is the primary factor when evaluating bids. Kentucky libraries have a long and illustrious history with the E-rate program. Uh, in the past few years, we average about 100 libraries that apply for E-rate, so that's about 80% of Kentucky public libraries. 
And the average funding commitment for the current funding year we're in, where application review is all finished, is funding year 2022. And the average funding uh, received by a Kentucky library is $17,000. So we do have some libraries, um, smaller libraries with inexpensive internet that might only be getting $800 from the program. And then on the other end, we may have some larger systems that are getting over $100,000, you know, because they have internet for a lot of buildings or they're doing a big networking equipment upgrade. So this is a substantial um, source of savings that Kentucky libraries can rely on. Since 1998, we've had more than $24 million dispersed. So that's almost a million dollars per year. And we've you know, grown in E-rate funding over the past several years. So at some point, I think the average will end up being over a million dollars per year. Right. When you are filling out E-rate forms, you'll notice that your library has a number called the Build Entity Number, which is assigned to your independent library or your overall library system. And that is the unique way that your library is designated um, on forms. That way, if there's another Greene County Public Library, they're going to know it's specifically the one in Kentucky. If you're an independent library, you just have your main branch, you may just have one number that designates you and that's it. If you are a multi-branch system, you may have the system built entity number that handles the filing on behalf of several different branches. Some libraries have entity numbers that would designate specific service locations. So it might be the main branch or even the bookmobile or multiple other branches throughout the county. Um, if you have any questions about entity, entity numbers, please let me know. Every Kentucky Public Library system has an overall entity number, but sometimes you need to add new ones or deactivate uh, entity numbers for branches that have closed. Uh, so please talk to me first. Um, I'll be glad to research what's already associated with your system before we turn to customer support to get new numbers. So KDLA creates an E-rate funding years chart for reference. Uh, this is sort of just a visual overview of the three most recent funding years that we're concerned about and deadlines for some of the major tasks. So if you access the full page slides, you'll have the hyperlink to go to the page where you can download a PDF copy of this. So right now we're in funding year 2022. It's the middle row you can see in blue. So we've already gone through competitive bidding, We've filed our applications, we've gotten our funding commitments, and now we're actively receiving services and uh, potentially doing some invoicing at this time. So now we need to shift our attention to funding year 2023, which will provide discounts on services received from July 1st of 2023 to June 30th of 2024. Now you may be thinking, huh, why is it abbreviated funding year 2023 when it goes from 2023 to 2024? So in short, somebody made a dumb decision back in 1998 and we continue to suffer. So I know most of us think about the state fiscal year or federal fiscal year based on when it ends, um, but E-rate abbreviates by the starting funding year which is why in E-rate, there's no such thing as a silly or dumb question, because honestly, a big question I get is, wait, what funding year are we talking about? So we're going to talk a little bit about the various steps of the process, just in brief, because we've got more in-depth training on the various forms and topics. Let's talk about eligibility for E-rate. So who is eligible to participate in E-rate? So I'm just gonna focus on the library side since that's really what concerns us. So libraries, uh, in order to receive their E-rate discounts, 
have to qualify for support from the Library Services and Technology Act, LSTA. This is the federal source of funding that supports KDLA. So for example, um, E-rate training and consultation is supported in part by federal funds. And in order for KDLA to you know, provide E-rate support or regional libraries or other uh, continuing education opportunities, your library has to qualify to receive support from us. So our agency is responsible for setting some eligibility definitions about the minimum standards that you have to meet in order to be an eligible public library. So those definitions are provided on our website. Um, I believe at this time all libraries are eligible uh, for both LSTA and E-rate supports. Occasionally we get some libraries that maybe have some problems with certifications and things, but in general everybody gets support from KDLA. There are also definitions for eligible bookmobile outreach vehicles or eligible library kiosks which we will address momentarily. So this is a special topic and I cannot spend a lot of time on this unfortunately, but I just want to put this out there. So if this topic interests you, seems relevant, you can look for some more information and then you can talk to me. So in recent funding years, we've started seeing some libraries add what they call a kiosk location. This may be staffed or unstaffed, and it's just maybe a smaller footprint where you're helping to get service to an area that needs it, where you really can't put in a full branch. You may not have the funding for it. And several of these libraries have received E-rate discounts to help provide internet access to that location and sometimes networking equipment or data wiring uh, that's needed to you know, set up that internet access. So some examples would be Bath County, they have a kiosk in Salt Lake, which if you know Salt Lake is a very tiny population. Uh, Bourbon County um, this year set up what they call a mini branch in Millersburg. And Jessamine County, they have JCPL Plus in Wilmore. And Trimble County has two kiosks. This is the first example would be the Milton kiosk. It's about 20 miles away um, from the main branch in Bedford, Kentucky. And they just have part of the building. Uh, it's part of a city building that is just designated for library use. And this year they've also opened a kiosk um, location in a park. So during the 2022 KPLA conference, um, some of these libraries joined me on a presentation about kiosks and Kentucky Public Libraries. So they talked about setting up these locations and the kind of E-rate support they received. And you can go view the slides for the, that presentation and then also some examples of the agreements that the libraries made with uh, the city or county about using certain space for the kiosks. So this is a good way if You've got locations that it's difficult for people to travel, but your library doesn't have the funding or can't justify putting in a full branch. Sometimes this is a good way to extend your services, you know, offer Wi-Fi to you know, a location where people don't have good connectivity. Um, so this is an interesting concept that I think is gonna grow not only in Kentucky, but around the country. Okay. Do you need to mention that if your library is applying for E-rate discounts, you almost certainly need to comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. This is a law passed in 2000 that specifies that when receiving federal funds for certain purposes, you know, schools or libraries um, have to make sure that uh, children have safe internet access at that school, at that library. So if you're applying for E-rate to get internet access, including hotspots for the bookmobile or anything under what we call E-rate category two, which we'll get to shortly, then you have to comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. The exception is if you're asking for discounts solely on telecommunications. So that would just be data transmission or transport circuits that connect um, multiple branches in your system. 
The only Kentucky library that does this currently is Lexington Public Library. They separately pay for their in access and they ask for discounts um, on the transport circuits that you know, allow data to pass between all the different branches. And SIPA is a great big topic. We do have an entire training on SIPA. I'm glad to talk to you about your library's compliance. There are three major element, <laughs> elements uh, to complying with SIPA. You have to have an internet, internet safety policy that addresses certain aspects of children's safe use of the internet um, at the library. At some point before you put that policy into effect, you needed to hold a public hearing and give proper notice of the hearing. And then most importantly, you have a technology protection measure, which is a fancy way of saying uh, filtering for certain visual images as required by SIPA. You're filtering for visual images that could be considered obscene, child pornography, or material harmful to minors, which is sexual material. And I'm glad to talk in depth about that because I can go 60 or 90 minutes on that topic easily. All right, now that we know a bit about the discounts, let's talk about what you can really get your discounts on. Unfortunately, when you're learning about E-rate, sometimes you have to go through an entire training to get a little bit of everything so you can connect the concepts. I've never found one good method to go step by step through the entire process. There's a lot of cross-referencing. All right, so E-rate eligible services. So every year, the Federal Communications Commission releases what they call the eligible services list. And this specifies the specific um, services or types of equipment that are eligible for E-rate support. So you can go to the USAC website to see the most recent approved eligible services list. Um, the FCC is often kind of late on approving the eligible services list, but it's not such a big deal because it doesn't change substantially from year to year. So the 2023 eligible services list is still in its draft version. I have linked to the FCC's website for that, but I expect them to approve that any old time. The eligible services list is split into two major categories. Under category one, we have connectivity to the building. So this is about bringing your internet access or that data transmission circuit you know, to your building. Category two is about taking that connectivity and getting that to various devices inside the building. So that might be public access computers wired on the network. It could be devices accessing the library's Wi-Fi. So this is just going to involve that infrastructure to make the connectivity useful in your building. Under category one, we have one service type. That is data transmission services and internet access. So basically this covers all sorts of ways to get buildings or bookmobiles um, on the internet. So most libraries at this point have fiber internet service. Uh, we do still have some libraries with cable or DSL. Um, along with those monthly charges, um, eligible uh, charges could include installation, um, the fees for your static IP addresses, and in some cases, like for cable internet, it could involve the um, modem fee or the router fee. There are also options for lease data lines dedicated to your library. A uh, big one for Kentucky Public Libraries is cellular data, specifically for the bookmobile. And there are discounts for the bookmobile with this type of service because that's really the only way to get internet service to that piece of moving library property. Otherwise, it's difficult for a fixed location like a library building or school building to get E-rate discounts on cellular data. Um, there are some larger school systems or even library systems that have more elaborate setups on which they get discounts. Uh, so some of them actually operate their own networks. Um, and also 
sometimes they will get discounts on modulating electronics to you know, light that fiber, make that service functional. So for funding year 2023, um, libraries will be asking for discounts on services received from July 1st of 2023 to June 30th of 2024. There's not a specific limit on the eligible costs on which you can ask for E-rate discounts as long as you're making the most cost-effective decision to meet your library's needs. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've got some libraries where they might only be paying $800 for the entire year for their internet service, and they may still be getting a 90% discount on that. Whereas, you know, we've got libraries that are paying 10,000 plus um, for their internet service. So as long as that's the best solution for that particular library, that's fine. You're not going to say for this particular building, the maximum amount of funding you can get for internet is $10,000. It does not work that way for category one. Uh, for category two, we have three service types. Um, the most significant service type that most libraries request their discounts on is called internal connections. So this is the, these are the pieces of networking equipment or cabling, data wiring, um, necessary to get your connectivity throughout the building. So we've had many libraries request sometimes very substantial discounts. Uh, sometimes we've had libraries basically rip out all their existing cabling and redo all their equipment, and they may be receiving 10, 20, $30,000 uh, of discounts on those major refreshes of equipment. And sometimes we have libraries that just need to uh, renew a license for their access points or just need to replace one piece of equipment. So they might be asking for you know, 1,000 or $2,000 in support. It just varies. So on the list, um, we've got various charges related to cabling, including the bulk cabling, the materials for drops, patch cables for your IT closets. This can involve installation of the cabling and also removal of the old cabling. And then switches, routers, wireless access points, wireless controller systems, firewalls, UPSs or battery backups, uh, racks for holding your equipment. Um, not many libraries ask about this, but you do have an option for caching services, um, antennas, connectors, and other p components that you need to make your equipment work. It's kind of the miscellaneous category. And then uh, software to make that equipment work. So there are some provisos because the E-rate program as it was originally conceived in the 90s, is about getting that basic connectivity to your devices. So unfortunately, at this time, um, advanced security features uh, like filtering um, or anti-intrusion, anti-malware, you know, all of those uh, functions you might want with, say, a firewall, or security functions, are not eligible for E-rate support. And most people say, but Lauren, don't you have to filter for SIPA compliance to get discounts on this equipment? The answer is yes, and it doesn't really make sense that you can't get E-rate discounts on you know, advanced security features for a firewall, but it's a federal program. It, it's going by the law, so it's weird. It's understandable that you think that it's just not the case. So it's possible that you would ask for discounts on a piece of equipment that isn't 100% eligible for discounts. Sometimes pieces of equipment will only be partially eligible based on certain features or based on the equipment that is being supported. So it depends on what type of equipment is stored in the rack or what type of equipment is connected to the battery backup. Um, so there's a big rabbit hole we can go down, uh, but that's just sort of the basic overview. Now for category two, there's a presumption that you may need to get some of this equipment installed early in order to take advantage of internet upgrades that would go in effect on July 1st when the funding year normally begins. So for category two, 
networking equipment, you have an option for early installation. So the earliest date you can purchase or install the equipment um, that you've requested discounts on is April 1st, 2023. Keeping in mind that if you opt for early purchase, you will likely need to pay the entire cost out of pocket. And then in July, when the funding year begins, then you can file a form to be reimbursed uh, to get your discount. There's also late installation for category two. So you can, for funding year 2023, uh, purchase and install the equipment by September 30th of 2024. There's also an option if say, you're getting equipment for a branch that's under renovation or construction. And if there's some unforeseen delay, that means you weren't able to get the equipment installed, there's an option to request an extension because that would be an extenuating circumstance. Uh, but most libraries try to make their purchases fairly early in the funding year. Just a reminder, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Category two has two more service types. The next is basic maintenance of internal connections or BMEC. And quite a few libraries get discounts on uh, some kind of maintenance subscription from the manufacturer. So just as examples, not as, as, an, as an endorsement, some libraries get discounts on Cisco SmartNets or um, I think like Palo Alto Networks or Extreme Networks, they have subscriptions where you get access to maintenance or technical support for a certain period of time, 24-7 you know, access. So that's you know, one way that libraries request discounts. There is the possibility of getting discounts on, um, so you've got a contract where a vendor comes to, to the building and performs monthly maintenance on your equipment. Um, that is certainly something you can get discounts on. There's also a setup where say the person just comes when a specific piece of equipment stops working, needs to be fixed, and you get charged for that. I will mention that those type of contracts where you've got somebody coming to do maintenance, um, it's been difficult to get the um, invoicing approved for that. And that's because a lot of libraries have to rely on you know, small local providers and they don't want to jump through the hoops of formatting their invoicing invoices in a certain way to meet the stringent demands of USAC reviewers. But we have had libraries apply for this. We have had successful invoicing, but just you know, keep your expectations kind of in the middle if that's something you're interested in. And now if it's a subscription for from the manufacturer for a piece of equipment, uh, there's a good possibility of successfully invoicing those discounts. If you want a really good explanation of basic maintenance, uh, Funds for Learning has um, an overview sheet. It's from 2013, but it is the best explanation I have ever found of basic maintenance. The third service type for category two is called Managed Internal Broadband Services or MIBS. This hasn't been a huge thing for Kentucky libraries yet, but I think this will grow in the future. So a managed service is where you've got a vendor that handles the daily operation and monitoring of your networking equipment. So this would be specific pieces of equipment eligible for E-rates like your firewall switches and access points. A lot of times you'll see the service referred to as managed Wi-Fi. So in that case, it's the vendor's responsibility. If your internet goes down, there are Wi-Fi problems, they're the ones who handle that for you. And you know, sometimes that can be expen expensive, but I think we're gonna see more internet service providers uh, move toward offering managed services. So, um, you know, that's just something if you're interested in, we can certainly, you know, include that in a bidding process and just see what comes back. Um, because you never know from year to year, it might be there's a company that's really interested in picking up some business and they're ready to make you a good offer to handle some of those functions for you. That may be an attractive option if 
um, your library doesn't have an IT support person on staff, um, that can alleviate some of that burden. So do we have any questions about E-rate eligible services? Okay, hear not. Carrying on. Now, with the eligible services list, I do need to add, there is sort of a miscellaneous section. So this may involve certain taxes or surcharges that uh, may appear on your invoices. They're very particular about those. Uh, you can rent or lease equipment rather than buying it outright. Um, shipping to get that piece of equipment to your library. And then if the vendor that installs the equipment can also provide training on how to use that equipment, um, that can be eligible for E-rate support. And as we mentioned before, installation and initial configuration. Okay, so now we know what we can get our discounts on. So how much of a discount are we talking? So every year, discount rates are calculated for schools and libraries. And the discount rate is based on two factors. Uh, the first factor is the percentage of students in the local school district who are eligible for the National School Lunch Program. Um, you might think of this as free or reduced lunch or the community eligibility provision. So schools are responsible for gathering that data. And one of their extra tasks for E-rate is that they have to go to their profile in the online portal and enter the new information um, each year. And since you're a library, your profile refers to the local school district and pulls that information over. So you don't have to go chasing somebody at the school district to get this information. It's going to automatically be on your profile when you go to file an application. The other criterion is whether or not your library system is overall considered rural or urban based on census data. So if you have a multi-branch system, you know, maybe the main branch is in an urban area, but you might have two or three branches in rural areas. So potentially your library system is overall rural. So we have a lot of rural library systems in Kentucky. Um, it's not the most user friendly, but you can look up the status for each branch. So once we take these criteria and combine them, we're going to look at a discount matrix to determine what the discount rate is. And behold, the discount matrix. So the discounts are pretty similar for both category one and category two, with the exception of the top discount bracket for category two. So for category one internet, you can get a 90% discount on that internet service for your main building or the bookmobile hotspot. But then for category two, the top discount uh, bracket cuts off at 85%. You may also notice that um, there's a more of an advantage to being a rural applicant. Um, in some ways, you've got additional brackets, so you may get more of a discount than um, an applicant in an urban area. So a lot of libraries stay in the same bracket over and over again. It's fairly steady, but it is possible to change from year to year. We have several school systems where you know, the number of the percentage of students, you know, it fluctuates between like 70 to 75% uh, of students qualifying for free and reduced lunch. And so some years your discount may be 80% and then in other years you'll be in the 90% bracket. Um, so it's something that you may want to consider when creating your budget is maybe running the numbers for, okay, if I end up qualifying only for an 80% discount, you know, how much money am I going to get get back? How much is the library really going to have to pay out of pocket? If you want to see what your current discount rate is for the current funding year, 2022, you can find that information in your library's profile in the E-Rate Productivity Center. So if you open the system profile, there is a tab to look at the discount rate. Um, for 2023, we won't know the final approved numbers until application review is complete. 
All right, a bit about Category 2 budgets. We mentioned before that Category 1, there's not a specific limit on how much funding you can request as long as you're choosing something cost effective. Now for Category 2, for your networking equipment and maintenance, managed services, there is a maximum limit on the pre-discount cost you can request your discounts on, and that is based on square footage. Now at this point, I'll mention that due to changes that went into effect starting with funding year 2021, the Category 2 budget has not been as much of a concern for Kentucky libraries. The budget floor was raised, so um, I don't anticipate many libraries you know, hitting their full budget. In the past few years before 2021, we did have some libraries where we had to say, okay, we can't get our discounts on everything because there's just not enough funding available. Um, that's really not the case anymore. So the category two budget tells you the maximum eligible pre-discount cost on which your library's E-rate discount rate can be applied. And the budget period is calculated for five years. Our current budget period started with funding year 2021 and goes through 2025. So that means during that five year period, you might have you know, some kind of major upgrade. You may use a lot or even all of the money in one year, or some libraries end up asking for a little bit each year. So as long as you're with, within the limit, it doesn't matter which funding year you spend those funds on during the five-year period. So in calculating the budget, um, USAC uses the interior square footage of eligible library branches. So they take the interior square footage and multiply it by $4.50, and that gets you the budget. Now, for some smaller libraries, um, there is a budget floor of $25,000. So if you do that math and you don't get up to 25,000, the system will automatically put you at that budget floor. And if you've got a multi-branch system, the budget will be calculated for each branch, but then they put it in a great big pot so that you can spend those funds anywhere in the system. So if you've got a tiny branch that doesn't have enough funding, but has a lot of needs, you know, you won't necessarily run out of funds because you've got so much square footage in other locations. Now for the calculations for the budget, you know, the main branch and your full branch libraries, that goes into the calculation. Kiosk locations can be calculated, even the bookmobile. So that's kind of a good way that some libraries have really increased their available funds because the bookmobile qualifies for category two, but obviously it gets the minimum budget, <laughs> which is kind of weird. The only library locations that are not eligible for category two are administrative only locations. For example, uh, Kenton County has an administrative building uh, where they've got you know, management and their technical services. There's not any public service offered from that particular building. So the administrative locations qualify for category one discounts but they don't get any category two. Uh, we don't have too many administrative locations. I think at this point, we're down to maybe two uh, for all Kentucky public libraries. Now, during the five-year budget period, if you are adding square footage, say you're putting addition, an addition on an existing branch, if you're building a new branch, you can increase the budget based on what the finished square footage is going to be. So it's important though, at the time you file the application, you have to have documentation to show that you didn't just pull a magical number out of anywhere. Um, you need something like the blueprints or a letter from the architect, something like that that indicates the square footage. Because during application review, uh, for that new square footage or that increase you've listed, they're going to ask you for documentation. That way, you, know, you aren't maybe cheating the program by claiming you know, square footage that you don't really have. Now, there is a tool for viewing the available Category 2 funding um, for your library. Um, so if you look at the full page slides, there's a link. You can take this tool and use the filter by build entity number, or BEN, 
to find the information for your library. Keeping in mind that the calculation is based on data in the E-Rate Productivity Center profiles. So if you haven't updated the profiles, you know, if I'm only going to show the calculation based on what the tool knows, um, you might need to do some math yourself if you're adding square footage or you're creating a new branch that's not yet set up in the system. I'm glad to answer any questions about Category 2 budgets. Okay, so for funding year 2023, this is a really good time to look at the various branches within your system, look at all those separate entity numbers and make sure things are up to date. I've always been surprised how how often libraries change addresses, they're doing construction projects, and they manage not to hear about it. Uh, so we have over 200 public service outlets in Kentucky, you know, for our 120 systems, and there are always lots of changes. So you may need to consider updating addresses. You know, if you've got, you know, an annex location, a new kiosk, you might need a new entity number for a new branch. Um, and you'll need the square footage, you know, for each of those branches, except for administrative only locations. So right now is the time period where, what, where we call it, the time period is called the administrative window. So during the administrative window, you've got freedom to make a lot of changes yourself, um, but the administrative window closes right before the application filing window opens. So at that time, they will lock down profiles and you can't make changes yourself. And that usually happens in mid-January because right after that, the application period opens. So if you need help looking up your library's information and making edits, uh, please talk to me. Quite a few of the edits you can make yourself. Um, if you need a new entity number for a new location, we'll have to work with customer service on that and I can help you put together the information to make that request go through pretty quickly. Okay, we're really briefly, high level, gonna look at the application cycle. So this is just a different representation of the various phases of the E-rate cycle. So most libraries need to file a Form 470 to start competitive bidding each year. That's where you say, hey vendors, here are the E-rate eligible services my library is interested in. And the form to start that process is made available an entire year in advance of the funding, uh, the funding year uh, beginning. So we've been able to file Forms 470 for funding year 2023 since July. The deadline for filing the Form 470 to start a competitive bidding process hasn't been set yet but it will likely be in late February. And the deadline for the Form 470 is determined by the deadline for the Form 471 application where you request your discounts. Now, what seems to be happening in the past few years is that someone at USAC will wait until the minute they are getting ready to walk out the door for the holidays and they'll hit send on a special email that says like, here are the deadlines, Merry Christmas. <laughs> it doesn't actually say Merry Christmas, but you get the concept. So luckily right around Christmas, we'll know the specific deadlines. So the application can be filed during a particular window that opens in mid January and closes in late March. So in order to file the application, you either need to be requesting discounts on an existing contract that got approved in a previous year, or you need to have completed competitive bidding and if necessary, sign your contracts. So after your application is submitted, uh, you'll go through a review. So sometimes they don't have any questions and you just get approved uh, pretty quickly. Sometimes uh, you may have to provide some documentation to clarify the eligible charges. Once your application is approved, you'll receive a funding commitment decision letter that shows which funding requests were approved and in, in which amounts and then the total amount of funding for that particular application. Uh, there's another form for indicating that you're starting services and making that certification about complying with SIPA. And then there are different options for invoicing. Okay, so very briefly, for the Form 470, 
This is the form where you say, here are the eligible services that I want. You may have details about the specifications you're looking for, internet speeds, the number of hotspots. Um, you can have preferences for some of the networking equipment. You can't say, I'm only going to accept this particular brand, um, but you can give really detailed information about what you need. Uh, this is the one mistake that is really not fixable for E-Rate. You must accept bids from vendors for at least 28 calendar days from the date you filed the Form 470. So vendors have at least that time period to submit bids. And then at that point, um, you know, if you've received all the bids you want to consider, you can evaluate them. With price is the primary factor. Choose your winning vendor or vendors and then move forward with a contract if needed. If you make the decision and sign paperwork before the 28 calendar days, that is a competitive bidding violation and you're not going to get your funding. Also, your process needs to be fair and open. So you're just giving the same information to all the vendors. They're getting a fair chance. And you have to keep a lot of documentation on your winning and losing bids and your bid evaluation, contract if you make one, your invoices. Um, it's really, really important. USAC is very, very specific about what qualifies for competitive bidding. We've done it successfully for a long time. But when I say 28 calendar days, I mean it. And then for um, some libraries, there is a bidding exemption. If you get a really good deal on business class internet that is at least 100 megabits per second download and at least 10 megabits per second upload, and it costs $300 or less per month for the branch, um, you don't have to go through competitive bidding because that's considered a good enough deal that uh, you don't have to request bids for that. So you just have your monthly invoice, for example, and you can just skip right to the application um, for that particular branch. So um, we have a number of libraries that qualify for this. If you're not sure, um, please contact me. We may need to look at your specific invoice, you know, recent invoice, and per perhaps contact your internet service provider to confirm what the download and upload speeds are. Okay, the application, the Form 471, where you request discounts. This is really important for libraries that have multi-year contracts. In order to get E-rate discounts, you have to file a Form 471 application every year. So there are some years where you may not need to go through bidding because you've got an ongoing internet contract or you've got that bidding exemption, but to continue getting discounts for that funding year, you have to submit an application. Sometimes folks think, well, my application was already approved. Yeah, maybe that was for the first year, funding year 2022, but if you want to get your discounts for the second year, you've got to submit the 2023 application. And it's very important that you know, if a contract or agreement is required for the services, if you have that agreement or contract signed, it's, it's very clear that you have some kind of agreement with the vendor before you file the Form 471 application. That's not the biggest mistake, but it is a large mistake you can make. And the application form is just going to have all sorts of details about the actual vendor that was selected, the particular service you're going to be getting, uh, just lots of details about all of that. And then the form will calculate based on the cost of your eligible services and your discount rates, the amount of funding you're requesting from the E-rate program. There is an application review process. That's a time for USAC to ask questions, but it also gives you an opportunity if you made a data entry mistake, things like that. You can fix the application in some ways um, before a funding commitment is issued. Very briefly, the Form 486 is a much reviled form because it really doesn't seem to be necessary. There are lots of arguments that the information on the Form 486 should just be rolled into the application form. However, this is just another step you have to take before you can get your hands on your E-rate discounts. You're just telling USAC, hey, those services that got approved on the application, this is when they have started or will start and I can flag with SIPA if I have to. 
and you have to have that form on file in order for your vendor to apply your discounts or for you to file an invoicing form for reimbursements, which is a spoiler for SPY or BEAR. So there are two invoicing methods for E-rates. One is service provider invoicing or SPY, and that's where your vendor applies the discount up front on your bills, and then they just charge you the difference. So if you get a 90% discount on your internet, they'll apply that discount, and then they will just charge you the 10% that remains. So that's a good way to cut down on your E-rate paperwork, your filing burden. Um, but to be honest, depending on what providers you're dealing with, they're supposed to offer SPY invoicing, but beggars can't be choosers. Sometimes you're just gonna have to file your own form for reimbursement, and that's called the bare form. So it's the build entity applicant reimbursement form. I just call it the bear all the time. And that's the form that you file as a library after you have paid the full cost of the service up front. So you fill out this form to say, hey, I paid the full cost for that service, and this is my approved discount, give me back the money. And that is sent to your library via direct deposit. It is more work in some ways, but it also gives you more control over the timing of when you receive the reimbursements. Because some vendors, they might apply the discounts, but they'll take their jolly time in getting that started. Um, I'm always glad to talk to you about the invoicing methods and every new E-rate funding year is a new opportunity to decide how you want to handle the discounts. So if for 2022, you've been filing bare forms for reimbursements, but for 2023, you want to try the SPY discounts instead, that's perfectly okay. Assuming you have a vendor who will play along. All right. And this is another special topic that I really don't have a lot of time to get into, but you may have already seen some of my messages about the unique entity identifier or UEI. So the UEI is a number that specifically identifies you for federal programs and it went into effect for federal programs starting in April, 2022. Those numbers are assigned in the Federal System for Award Management, or SAM.gov. Now, at this time, a little over two-thirds of Kentucky libraries have their ID numbers, but it's possible more have them, and I just can't find them in the public search. So um, if your library is going to need to file any bare forms, if your library is going to need the UEI, you will also need full entity registration with SAM.gov. So there's an option just to get the UEI, just that ID number, but then there's also an option to complete full registration where you provide more information about your library, including direct deposit information. So starting next spring, possibly next summer, libraries that need to file bare forms are gonna need the UEI with the full registration. That's something that we got really recently confirmed. And I have a lot of experience with the UEI at this point, so if you need help, please let me know. I've provided a list of the UEIs that I'm aware of as of today. Um, if your library has one and I'm not aware of it, please let me know. Okay, we're not really gonna talk much about the E-Rate Productivity Center because we're running very low on time, but this is the portal where you file your E-Rate forms. And so, um, sometimes we refer to this as EPC or EPIC for short. Um, libraries may have several different users. One person is the account administrator that handles creating new accounts and deactivating them on behalf of the library. But you may have several folks in there. And this is where you make profile updates. You file the Form 470, you file the Form 471. I've also provided a link to um, the information I have as of this morning for which person at the library is considered the account administrator. Now, some libraries have out-of-date account administrators. It's somebody who used to work at the library two or three years ago. It's important that we get this information updated. So if you check that list and you realize, mm, wait a second, that person's not here, we don't have access to that email, please contact me and we'll figure out the best way to get the account admin role transition to somebody who is actively you know, working on e-rates. 
This is more information about the account admin, um, but again, please contact me first before going to the Client Service Bureau. And these are very brief directions for the account admin about adding some additional users uh, to have accounts to log in and perform E-rate tasks. And then for users that log in for the first time, after your account is created, you get a message um, that tells you to go to the portal and perform a password reset. And on your first login, there is this massive list of terms and conditions. So you have to accept that before you're ready uh, to file any E-rate forms. And if you have login problems, sometimes I can help you. There are weird technical quirks, uh, but sometimes we need to reach out to the Client Service Bureau. And here's just a very brief overview of your applicant landing page. This is the main page where you perform tasks or you've got links to go elsewhere in the system and do what you need to do. So these slides just have some brief notes on what you can do from the landing page. And then I'm going to go a little bit over time. I'm so sorry. Uh, I've got a little checklist for things you might need to do to prepare for funding year 2023, as far as making sure that the information about your library and the system is updated. Anyone who needs an account for the system has one. Figuring out what your library needs, if you have existing contracts for those services. Um, if you're Seeking Category 2 funding, uh, making sure that your budget information is accurate. And if you're, there's a construction project, you know the estimated completion dates, because um, that matters in whether or not you can ask for E-rate discounts. Uh, making sure your library is SIPA compliant and asking for help from KDLA. E-rate is, it, it's a great program that has really helped Kentucky libraries, but it's complicated. It's basically my full-time job to keep up with E-rates. So at any time, I would prefer that you come to me with questions rather than trying to muddle through yourself. Because sometimes um, if you're not really familiar with the task, you can spend more time you know, trying to do a draft or do it first than it would take, and then like having to correct things than if we had just worked together in the first place. So I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one appointments where we do screen sharing so I can follow along with what you're doing and help you out to avoid some of the um, pitfalls for certain applications that might be confusing. Just to wrap up, do you want to mention, I've been talking about money, money, money. And money is great. E-rate funds, they help libraries with other technology purchases. But also sometimes that's that bonus funding that is helping support summer reading or collection development or some kind of you know, programming. So you know, it's a pretty steady source of discounts that a lot of Kentucky libraries really rely on. But you know, with the purpose of the program being to make connectivity more equitable, you might also think about it as a good process for helping improve your library's connectivity for the benefit of the community that you serve. So here's a picture of a bookmobile from Boyle County that has Wi-Fi. In fact, Boyle County uses two hotspots and they have a special router that the two hotspots are connected to for different carriers. And then everybody connects to the router and it's always picking up you know, the best signal it can. So this is a way on the route, not only for the bookmobile driver to perform circulation, but also to provide Wi-Fi, because that might be the only opportunity some folks on your route have to check their email. Um, and you know, if you're going to do programming inside a building, you might need that in order to perform you know, part of your programming. So it's really important for those folks who don't have the access that they need so that's why there are a lot of requirements, but it's been a really good way to improve connectivity. And I can't tell you how much more bleak connectivity in Kentucky Public Libraries would be without the upgrades that we've made with E-rate supports. Huge, huge, huge um, improvement for library internet around the state. 
Um, got some links to some basic resources. I will mention that I haven't made updates to KDLA's pages much recently. We're in the process of transitioning our website. And I don't want to put a bunch of stuff on the website and have to redo it on our new site that is coming soon. Um, there's also links to um, you know, support from USAC. Um, their website has a lot of information. Also, if you're interested in seeing an overview of what your library has received or been approved for for E-rate discounts in previous funding years, uh, there's a consultant co consulting company called E-rate Central. They have a page where uh, for Kentucky, you can put in your library's build entity number, and then you can see this nice overview and then drill down into each funding year. So whenever somebody calls me with E-rate questions, that's the first place I go to get a basic orientation about what's happening. So that's not a secret. I'm telling you because I find it super useful. Okay. Um, if you aren't already subscribed to the Kentucky Tech Listserv, you may want to join because that's where I send a lot of the E-rate reminders, uh, notices about these webinars. Um, sometimes I use fun pictures little memes. So um, it's worth joining. So you can contact me directly if you want to be added. And then I will say thank you very much for hanging with me through some technical issues today. I highly encourage you to contact me directly if you have questions. You can reach me at lauren.abner at ky.gov or 502-564-1728. Uh, shout out to the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, they are the federal agency that handles the Library Services and Technology Act funding. And I wouldn't have a job and it wouldn't be here to help you with E-rate if it weren't for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So thank you very much. I'm going to